Since its very founding, the defining frameworks of our country, democracy guiding our politics and capitalism our economy, have been in tension. And in no single area has this conflict been more clear than our media, responsible on the one hand for informing, agitating, entertaining, and inspiring us. American media have also become tools by which merchandise is sold, data is collected, and money is made. Are these two goals mutually exclusive, or can we effectively regulate them so both can be served? Helping me navigate these questions today is Victor Picard, assistant professor at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also most recently the author of America's Battle for Media Democracy, The Triumph of Corporate Libertarianism and the Future of Media Reform. Welcome, Professor Picard. Thank you for having me on the show, Peter. Absolutely, a pleasure. Um, let's, let's see, in, in your book, you contend that the 1940s, from a media perspective, happened to look a lot like the 2010s. So let's go back almost four score years ago and listen in to the father of radio, uh, Lee DeForest, as he addresses the National Association of Broadcasters and, and quote, what have you gentlemen done with my child? He was conceived as a potent instrumentality for culture, fine music, the uplifting of America's mass intelligence. You have debased this child, made him a laughing stock. The occasional fine program is periodically smeared with impudent insistence to buy or try. Soap opera without end or sense floods each household daily. So I guess if that's the circumstance of the day, what was going on um, that elicited such a damning comment from someone so passionate about the medium of radio and hopeful for its potential? I think Lee DeForest was capturing a general anguish about how people were feeling towards this still new medium, this potentially democratizing medium, radio. Mm -hmm. And many people felt it wasn't living up to its democratic promise, it wasn't fulfilling this potential. Many of the things you hear today about the internet, that this medium is going to revolutionize the way we govern ourselves, the way we talk about important social issues. Uh, many people were saying this about radio uh, in the 1930s and 40s, but by the mid-40s when Lee DeForest made this, this damning uh, statement, people had sensed that something had gone wrong with, with radio. It had become overly commercialized, it was being dominated by a handful of corporate monopolies. And uh, I think that this is what you sense from from this kind of quote that he was so upset about what had happened to his baby as he as he said and you see this media reform movement emerge in the 1940s okay so so then we we what are the media challenges uh, that we face today uh, that, that maybe parallel those of the 1940s if we're if we're connecting the 40s to, to our own our own era so similar to what was happening in the 1940s again uh, what we're hearing about today, this domina domination of media monopolies over our core communication infrastructure. Hmm. So in the 1940s, we're mostly talking about CBS, NBC. Uh, there was a smaller uh, network called Mutual Broadcasting System, MBS. But generally, we're talking about a duopoly. And uh, many people were trying to organize around these media reform issues, you had people who were very upset about the nonstop advertising on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they used terms of derision, like they called them plug uglies and singing jingles. Mm -hmm. um, they were very concerned about what was happening to their programming, nonstop soap operas during the day. Um, so I think a number of these uh, indictments against commercial radio were crystallizing into a full-fledged media reform movement in the in the 1940s. Now, today we have net neutrality, which is certainly uh, a mobilizing uh, moment, um, and similar to the to the moment uh, that was reached in the mid 40s. Um, we see average citizens writing writing on the issue. Activist organizations such as Free Press, Center for Digital Democracy, ACLU who are taking certainly a very strong position uh, for greater media access and equality. Um, what seems to be lacking 
is an advocate at the federal level, yeah? Uh, certainly in the book, you, you introduce us to Clifford Durr, to, to Lawrence Fly at the FCC, who really helped turn that ship in a different direction. Um, tell us about today's FCC and uh, its, its apparent mission and vision of our media. That's an excellent question, and many people have been sort of scratching their heads trying to figure out uh, what is the direction of the FCC, what will they do, especially there's been a lot of speculation around Tom Wheeler, who as many of your viewers know, I'm sure, is a, is a former uh, lobbyist for uh, the cable and uh, cellular uh, industries. So um, there's always been some concern that Tom Wheeler would not have the political will or the instincts to actually challenge um, some of these entrenched commercial interests, but we might be uh, pleasantly surprised uh, by what he does, um, although at this point it's not even a surprise because we know that at the very least he's going to push for pretty strong net neutrality protections. Um, he, he wrote uh, an op-ed um, recently uh, describing his position, although many of the details are yet to be revealed. So I think that what this actually shows is that even uh, mainstream, industry-friendly FCC commissioners can be pushed by, by social pressures, by public uh, interest, and I think that's that's a very good thing to see. Um, let's take a look outside of our own country, um, because most other advanced democracies deal with the challenge of, of building a, a responsive media by removing much of the profit-making motive. Um, think the UK's BBC and the CBC to the north. Um, while critics of state-regulated and subsidized media worry that it would become state-controlled media, um, what does the research actually show about when governments help subsidize uh, the media for a country? So the research actually shows uh, what might seem counterintuitive for a lot of Americans. A lot of Americans, when they hear media subsidy, those two words in the same sentence, they fall into a fetal position. Um, it, it, it runs against a lot of our assumptions about the proper relationship between government and media. But in many countries, as you know, this is not a controversial idea. Many media systems are publicly subsidized. The BBC is always trotted out, but most leading democracies have very strong public media systems. And what the research is showing is that, and, of, and I'll, I'll just put the caveat out there that sometimes it's hard to show causation versus correlation, sure. but at the very least, they're finding that uh, publicly subsidized media institutions do not tend to be more subservient to those in power. If anything, they tend to be more autonomous, more independent, even more adversarial to those in power compared to privately owned, say, commercial newspapers in the United States. Mm -hmm. So publicly subsidized media actually can provide more critical coverage. Mm -hmm. They're also showing that the publics in these countries tend to be better informed and better engaged around particular issues compared to the publics of high, highly commercial systems. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the, it's no longer just speculation or polemic. It's now uh, we actually have empirical evidence to at least suggest that the very, very these countries aren't sliding towards totalitarianism. What what organizations today do you think are are, are articulating an alternative vision for our media? Um, uh, that, that you would support and, and that are organizing to try and make that vision a reality and that, that well, viewers might want to check out. Absolutely. So one group that I think you may have mentioned in passing, in full disclosure, I used to work for them, mm -hmm. Free Press, uh, is, is one of the leading, probably the leading media reform organization in the United States. Um, in terms of sustained engagement around these issues. They've been working on net neutrality and internet policies for over a decade. They've been fighting media concentration. Beyond free press, you've got Common Cause. Uh, the former FCC, FCC Commissioner Michael Copps 
has been very active with Common Cause and has been out there on these issues. Public Knowledge is another organization that's been uh, very devoted to media reform issues. And then I will uh, note that there's a lot of local media justice uh, organizations out there. One that I'll mention that's very active here in Philadelphia, the Media Mobilizing Project, MMP. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been very active in opposing Comcast on a number of local policy issues, and I think they're doing f fantastic work. Mm -hmm. So those are just a few. But of course, average... Uh, citizens and media users, consumers, sure. I think they're the ones that have to be tr really active on these issues. I would, I would point to um, the people who are writing to the FCC, writing to the, their members of Congress. That is essential activism. Anything, anything else you feel would be important for viewers to know, uh, either about the, the contemporary media scene, Victor, and, and maybe means to democratize it, or other ways that your research of the 1940s can sort of inf inform our understanding of, of the media landscape today? Yes, well, I think one lesson that uh, emerges from my research of the 1940s is that we, a, a couple of things, we ignore, first of all, we ignore media policy at our own peril. So. Um, it's almost a, a cliche among activists, but whatever your first issue is, whatever your, your main political concern is, your second issue really should be about changing the media system. It should be about some kind, some form of media activism, because without a democratized media system, you're not, you will not get very far uh, advancing your, 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 politi your personal political project. Um, the second um, lesson that emerges from this research is that we need to focus on structural alternatives. We need to maintain a structural critique to the media system. And what I mean by that is that we can't simply expect to shame commercial media monopolies into being good. Um, we need to actually have strong regulatory uh, actions that keep them in line, but we also need to create our own public alternatives. We need structural alternatives to the commercial media system, and this would range from a uh, expanded public media system, a, you know, for example, a reinvented pro public broadcast system, mm -hmm. but it also would entail creating what's known as municipal broadband internet networks. And I think this is another uh, point that, that President Obama has come out on and the FCC seems to be supporting, mm -hmm. but we need to have an alternative to the internet service monopolies and duopolies that dominate so much of our internet today. Sure. Well, I can't thank you enough, Victor, for, uh, for taking the time to speak with me today. Uh, also, certainly for doing the research that it took to, uh, to write America's Battle for Media Democracy. And uh, to thank you for introducing us to the, to the individuals, the organizations, and a movement um, that we might tether our hopes to as we, as we uh, deal with media challenges of today. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Peter. I've really enjoyed it. You bet. Those who forget the past are bound to repeat it, said Santayana. In the case of our media, the lessons are there for the taking, and we need not repeat the mistakes of, for example, the 1940s. What seems to be lacking today, however, is a clear consensus regarding which domain must take priority, our politics or our economy. But let's be clear. Democracy made subservient to the market will, before long, become oligarchy, the rule of the wealthy. We need only look around us to see plentiful evidence of this truth. So let's get it right this time. Support organizations you believe champion the country you want to live in. Encourage the five FCC commissioners to take a stand. You can find their emails at FCC.gov. And believe that your voice can be heard. For Professor Victor Picard, I'm Peter Bermudis for Arlington Public News. If you live in one of the 22 communities that appear on your screen now, you likely belong to the Mystic River watershed. This vital resource is a natural living system that we all share. Since 1972, the Mystic River Watershed Association has successfully fought to protect and restore this treasure. Now I'm asking you to join that effort. Please go to mysticriver.org to become a member and to find out how you can help today. While most of us have embraced digital culture and have difficulty imagining an hour 
much less a full day, without going through our email, surfing the web, or updating our Facebook page. We also harbor an unease with our reliance on these technologies, since we may be missing out on other, more important experiences while online. But we generally keep these concerns at an arm's length as the cursor pulses on. Joining me today to discuss this growing disquiet is fellow Arlingtonian Sven Burkertz. While you may associate him with one of his previous books, The Gutenberg Elegies, he is most recently the author of Changing the Subject, Art and Attention in the Internet Age, the basis of our discussion today. Thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. As I understand it, um, you had a conversation with a friend who shared with you a challenge, and the challenge was very simply sitting down with a book and reading it for a sustained period of time. Um, getting three to five minutes in, he felt the impulse to get up, to do something else. He was skittish. Um, your intuition was that that experience was illustrative of something deeper, uh, something that you know was shared with a, a wider group of people, not just your friend. So you explored it. What did you, what did you find? Just to be clear on the record, it, was, it wasn't a challenge with a friend. It was a, an article that uh, was kind of a big splash in the Atlantic when it came out and was the basis for a book. Um, by Nicholas Carr, mm -hmm. and the article was dramatically entitled, Is Google Making Us All Stupid? Mm -hmm. And the book then became The Shallows, and it was really questioning these things. And he opened that article by saying that he himself had noticed much to his um, dismay that these days when he sat down at the end of the day and wanted to resume what had always been his great cherished pastime of, you know, immersing in a good book, it was getting harder and harder. Um, at the level of reflex, he just couldn't quite focus. The eye wanted to jump forward. He was impatient. He wanted to, um, I mean, I do think we very quickly adapt reflexively to the things that we do in our lives. I think it's no secret that a huge number of people will spend most of their day within two or three feet of a lit up screen with writing and pictures on it um, that can't but condition us and uh, we can go into that more but well, it's definitely the root of yeah. the in a sense you mentioned um, earlier book on this the Gutenberg allergies and that was very much focused on the computer and its specific sort of uh, impacts on you know reading and the literary culture and so on and I'd say the difference between that book and the current book is that I, I don't see the computer any longer as a single um, formative entity. I think it has bled so deeply into every part of our culture that it's in fact an environment, you know. Mm -hmm. The microprocessor is everywhere. All of our activities are conditioned to some degree by this uh, amazing power that we have sort of unleashed, much of which is hugely good and gratifying but I just don't think you can have any power that doesn't have a kickback effect. And so that's the part that right. interested me. What right. is it? Well, you write about one of your, your real worry um, being that it's less to do with sort of the overthrow of the human intelligence by artificial intelligence and more sort of at the, at the very rapid erosion um, of certain types of thinking. Um, what, what types of thinking do you see as sort of between the crosshairs because of this shift yeah. in, our, in our culture? And what I'm looking at, art and attention to me bring us into the zone of um, the other kind of intelligence, which I would say is the more reflective, contemplative, uh, not so much the goal-oriented, instrumental sort of intelligence, but it's more the exploratory, the daydreamy. It's got a whole range. Mm -hmm. I think the side of the intelligence that I feel is sort of being put under some pressure and a little bit endangered is also the one that uh, coincides most closely to what we experience as our own subjectivity. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're busy filling in boxes and doing this, we're not being our subjective selves. Those are usually more the province of the expressive arts and so on. That's where we recognize, mm -hmm. you know, who we are. And so I feel that if we are being, um, you know, 
curtailed or sort of threatened in those realms, it's not merely that it's hard for a person to sit and read a book or stand in front of a painting or sit through a 90-minute uh, concert. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an outer symptom. What it really means is that to that degree, we're also sort of interposing a kind of uncomfortable static between you know, our subjective sense of ourselves and uh, you know, the world. It's, it's, we're changing, you know, or there's the possibility that we may begin to sort of um, eliminate, I don't think we would entirely, but you know, kind of downplay sides of our human spectrum that have formerly been given much more bandwidth and now it's being displaced by this constant claim of uh, multiple mm -hmm. stimuli. Right. You know, a little bit of email is a wonderful thing. A little bit of everything is great, right. but the nature of, it's both, you know, the extraordinary uh, efficiency and design intelligence of the technology. Right. I think it's the enormous cultural pressure that comes through at the corporate level on down through advertising. It mm -hmm. becomes mm -hmm. a social expectation that, um, mm. This is how we live, and these are our protocols, yeah. and these are enforced socially at every turn. Mm -hmm. So there is that feeling of just being hemmed in, and you then are very quickly uh, labeled a crank when you deviate. So right. the person who insists on walking the five miles to work or whatever is seen as kind of a benign, slightly mm -hmm. daft person, or whatever, and the person who, you know, won't use the cell phone, which was me up until a year ago, is yeah. you know, starting to get to be an irritant, but uh, yeah. we'll excuse him up to a point. Right. You know? There's the flip side of it, which we hear a lot about, which is helicoptering. Yeah. Parents now being enabled, and there's an expectation that they can constantly reach in and sort of just check, see if the kid is doing okay. But it creates a little net around every child of uh, parental vigilance. Although the social media affords different opportunities yeah. for kids today than we ever had, sure. you know, kicking around the woods or whatever we did, the city, depending right. upon our right. location. Right. No, it's really interesting. Yeah. And... Well, I mean, you know, I think you recognize, you, you, you recognize some of the upsides of these technologies. Certainly there are those who would say, you know, uh, these technologies allow us to be more productive, to be more efficient. Um, they allow us to navigate our lives with greater ease. Aren't those good things? And, and don't they, to, to some extent, maybe um, outweigh or, or sort of overcome the downsides that you're, you're poking at in, in changing the subject? Well, you can always pose that really dire um, scenario of the, your end of days scenario where you're in the, uh, you know, there with your relatives around you, mm -hmm. reflecting back mm -hmm. on it along and lovely life you had, and at that moment, whether you'd ask that you're really glad that it was very efficient, very productive, and all those things, or is there a little lurking sense that maybe it could have been a little more imaginative, exploratory, more full of odd side roads and daydreams, you know. Yeah. So I'm not saying that those things that I'm talking about are the all of life. I just think that they should be the more of life, and that... Yeah. As all of our systems, I mean everything from you know insurance on down, um, gets you know systematized and oriented around a grid that you're required to fill in correctly, or else right. you're stuck. Um, it gets really harder and harder to find those little sort of those wayside places where you're not being hounded by the culture of the moment. I think, in general, and this is something I've thought about for long time in different modes, but um, I guess at one point I was thinking of it in terms of the opposition between two very different kinds of time. One is clock time, as we're you know mm -hmm. aware of it ticking along. The other is <clears throat> sometimes defined as duration time, which is really time when you're not aware of time. So it's kind of a... You know, in the flow. It's a flip. Yeah, in the flow. And um, I think a lot of my interest is trying to think of how we can live and what we can do given that this isn't going to go away. People aren't going to say, oh, you know, we're going to embed as ever more deeply. But um, does that mean we're 
trapped, stuck, without recourse. Um, and that's why the word attention, I guess, is so important to me in this part of the title of the book. Mm -hmm. um, I basically propose, and I don't by any means mean that it's the only thing or the one thing, but for me it's the one I was most interested in investigating, is kind of the restorative power of art in various ways. I don't mean just painting art, but anything that's, that took time and imagination and, you know, creative pursuit. Creative pressure to create mm -hmm. is also something that um, offers us something to hold up against that relentlessness. Mm -hmm. But it, for that to work in any frame, whether it's in terms of listening, looking, or reading, it requires us to be able to attend to it. Mm -hmm. It makes it hard for us to become so singularly attuned to the one thing that's in front of us. And it doesn't have to be a work of art. It can be making a pie crust, mm -hmm. but it is bringing yourself fully to bear on what you're doing in a way that suddenly if you've spent most of your time being in some state of distributed awareness, which I think is a lot of how we are forced to live, then the action itself, almost no matter what, when we find that we're just absolutely riveted, watching a snail going along the windowsill, mm -hmm. um, something happens. Something happens. That which is fragmented, at least for that moment, you know, is made into a singular point of focus. One of the concerns that, that comes to the fore for me is, is, is again, for, it's for our children, it's for our children's children in the sense that we have the recall mm -hmm. to this pre-digital time. They have very little reference to that. It's true. So how, what, can they, what can they conceivably draw on to distinguish between those two modes of being, if you will? I don't think anyone at this point is yet um, fully out of reach of those experiences. I think we had them as a matter of course because we were not electronically surrounded. They have them, but it's within a different environment, and it is a more surrounded thing. But yeah. they've been in the woods. They've sure. read books. They've sure. listened to things. You know, there's the germ. And, um, you know, I think in part, it's not that we are all such sheep that wherever, you know, corporate society decides to direct us that we'll go there. We know very well when we're feeling alert and satisfied and somehow true to something that feels right. And we know when things feel distracted and vague and, right. you know. And we'll, you so know, I think everyone works on it in their own way. I want to thank you for joining me today. Total pleasure. Uh, for adding your insights, for changing the subject. Um, certainly it was not an, an, an idle work. It, it, it entailed... Mm significant effort and thought and uh, and thank you for uh, for giving that up to us as Absolutely. it were. Absolutely. Well thanks for the really good good questions. You uh, you made a path through I, some of it. We tried. Good. We tried. Okay. Our cell phones, our email, the internet. They all await us with their promise of unending news feeds, correspondence from far off places, status updates. We are entertained and informed by our technologies, but these tools also come with the capacity to rob us of experience, that which provides depth and context to our lives and relationships. As such, they have become a virtual Pandora's box. Beware their enchantments. For Sven Burkertz, I'm Peter Bermudis for Arlington Public News.